We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. As social media works too, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get lost in the mix. They don't end up in the wrong folder or anything like that. Or I just don't see them, miss them in the scrolling guy on Twitter of data that's just constantly going by. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight's topic comes from Facebook, where Dan Walker asked, looking for suggestions on games that seem heavier than they actually are. All right, so when I saw this question on Facebook, I totally read it completely wrong. I went on to reply to uh, Dan and talk all about games that surprised me by how much of a game they were and linked Dan to our article about games that surprised us and that were surprisingly complex. The problem with this was that wasn't what Dan was asking. Yeah, I totally did that wrong, jumped the gun, and was talking about games that were more complex. And that was our topic from a couple weeks ago, episode 103 of our podcast, which, of course, we'll throw a link to. And I felt a little embarrassed. Once my error was pointed out, though, I was looking at it going, well, then I should link you to our article. Well, wait, we haven't covered that yet. You know what? This is actually a really good follow-up. So that's why we're here today. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Some more games that surprised us, but surprised us by being simpler, quicker, easier, and or less complex than they seem at first blush. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So what I, I actually love the feeling of sitting down to a big, heavy game, right? Something that's taken up your whole table. There's tons of counters. There's resource sheets there's just stuff everywhere there's a huge rule book and like i'm actually intimidated to play and i'm like oh i don't know but then you start playing and you're like wow this isn't that bad at all i love that feeling like to me those are some of the best games in my collection those games that are, are meaty enough with good decision points and lots of player agency that aren't overwhelming or too complicated or bog you down or make you think too much so it's work like i love a meaty game but a white what i like more is a meaty game that you can digest a bit at a time with plenty of onboarding that just makes the game so much easier to eat. Well, now, unfortunately, this could also encompass games that look like big, beefy, brainy games and are nothing but rolling moves. But we're mm. going to focus on games that are also good <laughs> and lighter than we expect. Very fair. Very fair. We will do that. So I'm going to start with the first game that came to mind when I first read this topic. Well, once I realized the proper version of this topic, and that was Anachrony, because I had to say this is one of the most overwhelming and intimidating games I own when you first start setting it up. It's just, it's huge. It's a table hog. And then one of the concepts of the game is it's about time travel and you can send yourself resources from the future as long as you pay them back later. And that just sounds like it's going to be mechanically clunky and, and hard to understand and difficult to, to think about. But what Anachrony does to help with this is a very slow build, especially at the start of the game. You start with limited resources at your disposal, basically not enough to afford what you probably want to do later. And your initial actions are limited as well on what you're going to be able to do. So you're going to have to take your initial actions to just build up those resources to be able to unlock the rest of the game in a way. And what that does is limits the decision tree at the beginning of the game. You're only going to have a possibility of going six different action spots. And with other players taking up some of those spots, your choices are going to go down as every other player goes. And then new options only on unlock once you've started to actually build your engine this is the one game that every single time i have taught this game and i i like to run this game at a great canadian board game blitz tournaments is players will stop me usually in the second turn sometimes in the third turn and always say something to the effect of wow this isn't as bad as i expected or oh i thought this was going to be way worse than it is or man when you first started describing this i was scared it's really not that bad this is one of the games that i see mentioned all the time when people talk about games they were scared of that ended up being okay or perfectly fine yeah, so I have to say, I, Anachrony seems like one of these games for sure, because you keep saying it's easy to teach, but every time you have explained this game on the <laughs> show, my brain just cringes and, 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 and tries to grasp the concept of time traveling resources. Um, so it's definitely, you know, from, from the way you explain it as being so easy, uh, it almost has to be because the, the lengths of explaining it are really, you know, brain bending. And that was... <laughs> Anachrony. 
right, up next, a game that I love way more than I thought. And I got, I, I was a late adopter of this game. This game has been out for a while, and I just fell in love with it last year. And that is Raiders of the North Sea from Renegade Games. This is a worker placement game based on Vikings. Um, and it's one of those you sit there and you look at the board and if you've never played the game before and you're like oh what the heck there's three different tracks on the side of the board who knows what they're tracking three different things you got to keep track of you got these pile of cards you got five cards in your hands you got this board in front of you that you have to put your people on then you got these spots all over the board with little miking meeple staying next to one just piles of resources and there's all these different resources and there's just stuff everywhere and it can be very overwhelming for new players but then once you learn it, like the basic mechanic of this game is put a meeple on the map and do the action at that spot, then take a meeple off the map and do an action at that spot. Now to make things easier, and again, we get into the onboarding of this game, is you only have the lowest level of meeple. There's three different levels and you have no Vikings to go raiding yet. So your initial options again are very limited. It's only after you've got some crew and provisions and a few higher level Vikings that all of the options are opened up to the players. Yeah, no, Raiders of the North Sea is another one where I, I have just been hesitant to even ask to sit down and play that one because of the uh, the curve. But I, everything I've heard about it has made it sound like just a, such a fantastic game. And that is Raiders of the North Sea. All right, up next, I've got Orléans, or Orleans, depending on who you ask. Uh, this is one of my favorite games of all time. Like, this is probably a top five game for me, if not higher. I don't rank my games in order, really. I just, it's up there. And I actually played some of this just this weekend, which we'll hear more about later in the show. But man, can this game intimidate people. And I got to witness this firsthand on the weekend because I was introducing it to my mother-in-law. Now, a big part of this is the setup scares people. There are a lot of things on this board. You put this board out, there's a number of little round followers you stack up, the piles of goods. You have to seed the board with goods. And then there's the fact everyone's given their own player board with a whole bunch of different worker placement spots on them that are all with no words, just iconography. And then there's the whole beneficial deeds board over on the side, right? Like there's just a lot going on. The thing is, this is another game, and this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the night, is where your starting stuff severely limits your actions at the start of the game. For one, you don't start with monks, scholars, or knights. That's three types of the, the worker placement spots, three types of the followers that you need to do stuff you don't even have. So don't even worry about those spots if you don't have those follower types. And then this carries on for the first few turns, because even if the first turn you get a knight, well, now you can unlock the few spots that have knights, but you still don't have scholars, right? And so on. Then there's also the fact that the beneficial deeds board, that's mainly uh, used later in the game for thinning down your bag. Well, you're not going to thin your bag at the start of the game. For one, it's just not a good move. But second, you actually can't send your founding figures, your founding followers to the board. You can't ever promote them. So you can't even take that option. So it's, it's that ramping up, right? So that you're always limited throughout the entire game. You're never going to be able to do every action because you're only going to draw at max eight followers out of your bag. And that's going to limit what you can do. You can never do all the things. And it's limiting those decisions that makes this game way more approachable than it seems. And it's also a good game where you can kind of teach it as you play because of those limited options of the game. It's like, look, you have these four people. Here's your possibilities and why you might want to do those. Okay, now that you've got one of those, here's the other thing you can do. Yeah, I have to say the first time you opened up Orleans in front of me, I was hesitant. Uh, it's one of those games where I would probably end up liking it. Or when I first see it, I'm mean, like, oh, this is going to be fun, but it's going to take a game or two for me to figure mm -hmm. out what the heck's going on before I can actually start enjoying it. And that wasn't the case at all. Mm -hmm. I finished that first game confident that I both knew what I was doing and that I really did like the game mm -hmm. all from that very first play. So uh, I definitely think Orleans fits this one from my personal experience as well. And that is Orléans or Orleans. Next, Zolkin the Mayan Calendar. All right, this one's weird because compared to the other games in the list, I can't tell you what secret Zolkin designers use to make this sing, like to make it work as well as it does. Now, thinking about it, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that what you can do is what's left after the other players have gone. So like, yeah, the first player's got some hard choices, but like a lot of the times it's like, well, I need grain, but I can't. And I want this and I can't, so what's left? So that's one part that kind of limits it. Um, 
And then it's the ability to adapt what you're doing to. So a lot of uh, the game kind of feels like uh, playing to see what's going to happen. Like you don't have a set. You're like, I need some corn. Not I'm going to take that corn spot. It's I need some corn. So I'm going to put it on the gear to get corn. And we'll kind of see where that goes. So it might be planning to get it in the second spot, but then something else opens up. So you leave your guy in the corn board a little longer. So I, I think that's an aspect of it. Um, also the fact that you start pretty basic, like you start off, you know, you're going to have to feed your workers. So everyone's going to need some corn. You can't build buildings without stone. So you have some general, everyone's kind of got to do them things, but then you can say branch out. You're like, well, I don't necessarily need the corn or whatever now. So I can work on the God tracks. I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe. This is one you have to kind of play to see it, whatever it is. Whenever I teach this game, someone, always points out that it's much easier to inspect it now maybe it's just the intimidation factor. maybe those all those gears that turn around just scare people away i'm not sure what the what it is but i have had many people many times tell me that zolkin is a much simpler game than they were expecting well i think part of it i mean zolkin's uh a medium heavy um yeah. I, I don't know what it's not it's probably close to a four uh on board game geek wow um and i have to say Again, it it appears terrifying. Uh, I I haven't sat down and and gotten Zolkin uh, out yet. Uh, although I should probably do a, a read through and we can try it on Board Game Arena. Um, mm -hmm. It it definitely is a a scary looking board, but it's just a worker placement. It has an interesting aging technique through the mm -hmm. gears, but it's just a worker placement. Um, so once you get over the hump of the terrifying look of it. Um, again, a worker placement is still a worker placement. Yeah, the only thing it really adds, it's not in most. Uh, the only other game I know that uses is the Manhattan Project is eventually you run out of workers and you have to spend a turn taking them back, right. which is a neat mechanic. It's You can keep putting them out, but eventually you have to take them off. And it's when you take them off, they activate, not when you put them on. Right. So it's, it's, it's got some neat twists. No, nowadays, it, like other games have done it, right? Raiders of the North Sea kind of uses that. But it does both. It does put right. it on and take off. Well, that was Zolkin, uh, the Mayan calendar. Now, here's one that blows me away every time I sit down to try to play it by how thin the rule book is and just really how little rules are in the game. And that is the Brass series. Now, I'm going to specifically call it Brass Lancashire because that's considered the best of the series. But this goes back to the original Brass as well as both of the updated versions. These are brilliant games. These are some of the best games I have ever played. Well-balanced, awesomely designed games by Martin Wallace. And these games are awesome for a number of reasons, but one is how quickly you can teach this game. Each round, player's only gonna take two actions and those actions are driven and limited by the cards they have in their hands. And it's pretty simple. If you have the name of a place you can build there and if you have a, 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 a building type, you can build that building type. Like there's not a lot of options there. There's only, I think three or four different possible moves and each actual possible move, each action is really simple. It's like put something out on the board, flip something over, maybe spend some resources. It's not the mechanics that make brass the heavy game that it is. It's learning how to use them. While you may not figure out the strategy the first few times you play this game, you may not be good at it. You're going to pick up how to do everything quickly and easy. It's the figure out when and why that's the learning curve in this game, not learning how to play. Uh, interestingly, uh, on Board Game Geek, Birmingham has the higher geek score. Okay, maybe I'm confused. I forget whichever one has beer, one does not. The one with beer, I got to admit that extra level does make it higher. I would think, which I think is the uh, the other one. Birmingham uh, is the harder of the two as well. Yeah, I think that's the one that also includes having to have beer for your people, which is a little, again, it steps up that learning curve. So I wouldn't right. say it's quite yeah, Bir as surprisingly easy. Birmingham is the newer one at 2018, whereas Lancashire is the older. Uh, the, the older, older which there is an updated version of Lancashire too, because yeah, it was just true. Brass and Brass Lancashire. So yeah, specifically Lancashire, though I do think it's true for Birmingham as well. I just think Lancashire, you should almost play first before the other to, for learning stuff. But you know what? They're close enough. Right. If you can only try one, why not try the better one? I personally own both, so I would introduce you to one than the other. Right. And that was Brass Lancashire or Brass Birmingham. All right, next one. I almost had Sean talk about this one, but we figured having him talk about one while I talked about the rest would feel out of place. And that is Pulsar 2849. Now, this is another one that 
setting it up scares people. This is an intimidating game. There's this huge round board with all these stars on it and different colored lines connecting them. And then a ridiculous number, honestly, like it's too many little sideboards that you stick at strange spots around it. They don't matter where they go. And it just, the board just kind of like Frankenstein's out. And then you cover most of these boards with tokens, chips and counters. And then there's a pile of dice you throw on and these blood drop things. And then there's this tech tree that just, almost the size of the board branching off out of the top of the circle. Like it's just so much going on. And I have a hard time fitting this well on my eight by four table than getting the players to sit around it and be able to reach everything. Like it's just one of those massively intimidating games. But again, this is one of those games where we've mentioned many times tonight that does something to make it more approachable, which is limiting your options each turn. Like on this game, you only get two turns, two actions every turn, most of the time. There is a way to earn a third bonus action. Most of the time you're looking at only doing two things. So that's one of the things. What you're doing is gonna be limited by the dice you have because only certain numbers can do certain actions. And then another bonus is right at the start of the game, a bunch of the actions require your ship. I think it's called your ship, your shuttle, your whatever, whatever the pieces you move around the board. So I didn't double check the rules for these games tonight. This is all going off the top of my head. Um, whatever you, you move your little shuttlecraft around and you can't do a lot of the stuff unless you're on specific spots where you pass certain things. So like the first turn of the game, of your two actions, one's going to be move your ship. Like for everyone who plays the game, 99% of the time, your first turn is going to move the ship. So now you only have one action to worry about. Now I got to admit the Pulsar almost dropped honorable mentions tonight. And that is the fact that to really get this game, it takes a lot of front loading. Because the first decision of the game is draft dice, and you're probably going to have the options of one through six, and you kind of need to know what all six of those options are. So I have to say what I actually recommend is skip that if you're teaching the game for the first time. Just let people draft whatever dice they want and then explain what options they have available that turn. And this is one of those games where you go to you don't have to finish. Like during your first learning game, maybe you play through turns one and two and restart. And that's probably a better way to onboard person to the people to this game instead of having to front load everything. But once that info is there, the actual decision points, like I said, it's such a small decision tree. It's I'm, I'm picking between uh, two actions my turn. That's it. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, this game is terrifying for so many people, I'm sure, to see spread out on a table. Uh, but especially if you like the sci-fi theme, uh, it, it all becomes really obvious and, and it's just, okay, this is all I can do. So these are the only things I have to focus on. Okay. I've learned those. Now the next turn, when something else comes up, mm -hmm. I now know three things. And the next turn, maybe I know five things because I got two different things. Uh, and so, no, you're not going to end up learning, going through your first game and knowing all the possible scenarios and, and winning things. Uh, but that's okay. And things are going to change every game too, because there are some randomized things about the setup as well. So it's okay that you haven't learned everything because everyone's sort of playing it new unless they've managed to get it to the table 15 or 20 times. Uh, definitely far easier than the setup of the game <laughs> would allow you to think. And that is Pulsar 2849. All right, next, I've got the Pathfinder Adventure card game. And this is one for me that I, I am one of the people who was intimidated by this game. Like the role-playing game it's based on, this game has a huge rulebook. Well, not as huge as the 900-page RPG rulebook, but this is the biggest board game rulebook out of every game I own. This is massive. That right there is going to scare some people away. The thing you have to realize, and it took me a bit to realize this myself, is that the Pathfinder Adventure card game is run at tournaments. And due to the fact there are tournaments with prizes where people can win cards rules have to be extremely detailed with every possible situation and card combination covered and timing of play and all the stuff you get from any tournament style game. Uh, I always like to compare it to Magic the Gathering when Sean and I first started playing back in the Unlimited rules compared to what the rules for Magic look like now with the very detailed timing and everything. And all of that's driven by um, organized play where they want everyone to play by the same rules, which makes sense. But most board games can leave some wiggle room for your personal group now this game scared me but then sitting down to actually play it actually plays really well and that huge rule book is actually a fantastic reference tool it's got a great index and it's great for looking up stuff during play 
we found it actually plays smoother than some other games we played. Yeah, I think the the card games have that adva- advantage of have being able to put rules right on that card. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, while yes, absolutely, there, there are these giant rule books and, and magic. I mean, it used to be stuck inside with the cards when we mm-hmm. first started playing, uh, and and it's grown. But again, once you understand that basic structure, so much of it can be loaded right onto those cards in front of you, and then if it gets a little tough, you've got the rule book to go to. Uh, and so for the, in this case, it's Pathfinder, the adventure card game. All right, next, I have Misery Farm, better known, or actually possibly better known as Misery Farm. Uh, otherwise known as Agricola or Agricola, depending on who you ask. And I'll probably say it three different ways in this podcast alone. Uh, this is going to follow the same trend here by being a rather complex game with a lot of options that only presents you with a small subset of them at a time. This one, even more so than I think any of the others I played in this game, because when you start, you play through various seasons and it's a worker placement game, but only, I think it's like five slots are unlocked the first season. And then you randomly unlock two more. And then the next season you unlock three more and the next season you unlock two more until eventually they're all unlocked. So it, it, very gradually builds on your potential options, which again, narrows that decision tree, which makes the game way simpler. Added to that is the fact that it is a worker placement game where if someone takes a spot, you can't take it. So depending on your position in play uh, order, the options you have are gonna be even more limited. Now with the base game, on the caveat, this goes to the original printing, because that's what I own, is there is a family mode. And by playing with the family mode, it removes a set of two sets of random cards from the game. Now what those random cards do is they add asymmetry, which is generally a good thing, but as far as onboarding and learning a game, it is perfectly fine to take those out. That way everyone's on the same page with all the same options at all the same time. Now, nowadays they have actually put out a family version of the game, which I know doesn't use the cards, but I think it also simplifies some of the worker placement spots. Again, I own the original print thing. I still have cubes for my animals instead of little animeeples. So I have to talk about the version of the game I have because I haven't played the others. Uh, But I was shocked by like, to me, this is, I wouldn't call it a gateway game, but it is very much like a next step from your ticket to rides or Catan's. It looks huge and intimidating. Uh, There is the misery factor. This is not a forgiving game. Uh, You may make mistakes and you could end up with a negative score, but as far as learning the mechanics of the game, this has a great onboarding system by teaching you a little bit at a time. Yeah, just because a game is hard doesn't mean it's not easy to teach and easier than it it might appear. It should be hard, as a matter of fact. We don't want, again, we don't want the roll and movies uh, games as we were talking about earlier. You still want a solid game. We're just looking for something that could terrify you at, at first glance but actually it isn't all that bad, even if you're never going to win. And that yeah, was when we, when I first wrote the, the topic of this, I had simple, surprisingly simple games. And I realized that had more connotations. Yeah. Like that's the, no, this game isn't easy. It's not even hard. It's just simple. You just roll dice or whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we're not necessarily talking about easy to win games either. We're talking about just games that seem like intimidating. Like, wow, there's no way I can learn to play this where you're like, wow, this isn't bad at all. And that was Agricola or Agricola or however else you want to pronounce Misery Farm. Yes. All right. The, the, the new hotness of the list tonight, I did have a classic on here. I'm I'm going to give a shout out to it, but I'm not going to talk about it. I did have El Grande on this list, but I decided to throw out the old grizzled game, the old area control game and throw on something shiny and new at the last minute. And that is based on some recent experience with this game. And that is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Now, the reason I wanted to put this on the list, because I would never, ever include Gloomhaven itself on this list. If anything, that probably could have been on our list of surprisingly complex games. Because when you compare Gloomhaven to the other dungeon crawling style RPG games like the D&D Wrath of a Shardalon or, or your Imperial Assaults or your Descents, it is way heavier and way more complicated than those games. This is not a hack and slash dice chucker. This is a uh, hand management um, action optimization. Don't waste any possible time. Work together or die kind of game which means there's no way, like this is going to scare the heck out of people, right? People are buying this, expecting this light game, and it's not. But now you have Jaws of the Lion. This is a standalone game in the Gloomhaven universe that is meant to be the new entry point to the system. And it is. It is a fantastic gateway to Gloomhaven. It does an amazing job of onboarding new players by very slowly 
and deliberately presenting new rules and mechanics through a series of five tutorials at the beginning of the campaign. It is such a better entry point that I'm like frustrated we didn't have this when we started playing and and everyone else who's just getting into it like say thank you to Isaac for creating this because it's so much better yeah no absolutely uh Gloomhaven is uh, shockingly hard I think so many people expect uh you know a, an RPG dungeon crawler um yeah. and it is not um I I think a lot of people have jumped in pro and, and discovered this uh, it, maybe if they haven't had the investment of the board game, jumping into the beta on Steam for the mm -hmm. video game, uh, you really sort of learn quickly that, no, this isn't, you don't just walk into a dungeon. No, no. The card management aspect of this game is uh, bordering on cruel. <laughs> and the fact that Jaws of the Lion has gone out of their way to just walk you through and mm -hmm. teach you in baby steps that are still enjoyable and, and not True. easy, but still, you know, meaty enough to keep your attention uh, is just amazing. And, and, and an absolute, you know, if you're, if you are interested in what they've done with gloom, that's where to go. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, there's nowhere else to go. And that was Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. All right, up next, I'm going to mention a name that immediately is going to put fear into some casual gamers, and that is Steffenfeld. That is a designer who immediately has connotations uh, attached to his name. This is a designer who is famous for point salad games with tons of options and ridiculous number of decision points where everything you do might earn you some points, but figuring out the right thing to do is always the difficult decision. Well, Strasbourg for me is the exception to the rule. The 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 Steffenfeld game that that doesn't isn't as much a point salad. That isn't a huge decision tree. Now, while no means a light game again, Strasbourg is the most easy to approach of all the Steffenfeld games I think out there. Carpe Diem, you could probably argue uh, for 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 similarly, but there's still more to think about in Carpe Diem than there is in Strasbourg. Now, the game itself is just a bunch of auctions using a closed economy that all leads to a mix. And here's where the Feld gets in and where you have area majority, area control, set collection and pattern making. So you still have a bit of a point salad there, but it's all about these auctions and winning these auctions and knowing when to bid all with a closed economy where everyone's using the same set of cards to make their bids. Now, well, again, similar to other games we mentioned tonight, this may take multiple plays to master the game. Getting the basics down, literally you'll have by the first, like after the first auction and you play through a lot of auctions, you're going to get it. Like we're going to do the first auction and be like, oh, I came in first, so I get this. And you came in second, so you get that. And you came in third, so you get this. And I came in fourth, so I get nothing. Okay, I get it. Next auction. Yeah, okay, I got it. Let's go. Let's play Strasbourg. Now, again, uh, the other great part about this game is it's quick for Feld. It's like lightning click, like an hour. And I, I honestly think if you play this and teach someone, play twice because you're going to have time to do it on an average game night, and it's well worth it. This is a fantastic game. Uh, it highlights just how diverse Feld can be in his games. Interesting. I See, I haven't played Strasbourg yet, uh, but I have played Carpe Diem online. Yeah. Uh, and one thing we, we've talked about many times on this game is how hard it is to learn to play something online and i yeah. didn't do the video watch before jumping into strasbourg this is when we were testing some of the other um non board game arena mm -hmm. sites uh and i found carpe diem really easy so to think strasbourg is easier is is, is shocking i guess uh it, it's know. the end game scoring tiles that you have to plan ahead for in Carpe Diem that I think make it that step above. Okay. So no matter how every round you're going to score one of them, it's right. that strategy of having to plan ahead and not realizing how limited those are going to be. And so you start building buildings because they're based on your frame and then you totally skip that aspect, you're just going to lose badly. It's that aspect that I think makes Carpe Diem just a little bit higher. Now, I would say in general, this goes back to our picking which games to play in our teaching episodes. I would go for theme. Why do people prefer auctions or tile laying? If they're like, oh, I'm a huge Carcassonne fan, I'll probably teach them Carpe Diem. Whereas if they're like, oh, I love Raw, then I'd be like, oh, I'll show you Strasbourg. All right. Well, that was Strasbourg from Stefan Feld. All right, I did have to keep a couple older crusty games on this list because uh, there's some great examples. And this is a longtime favorite of mine, Power Grid. For many years, this was my number one game. It's still up there. I still love this game. And back when I got into hobby gaming, this was considered to be one of the most intimidating and heavy 
at least heavy seeming games. Like this was the big bad boy people broke out. They're like, oh, we're going to play some power grid. Like you look at the map on this and it's like risk with all these connections. Like you get this huge map of either Germany or the US. You got all these pipes everywhere with numbers on the pipes and there's prices everywhere. And then there's this huge resource market at the bottom with four different types of wooden goods and, oh, and stuff on the bottom. And you're like, wow, I there is a lot going on. And then you've got the power plants and, and the winner is however builds many plants, but only the ones that are powered. But then again, this game does a lot to slowly ramp up. For one, the starting power grid, the starting power plant market is limited. Now, just the first time, but there is a rule where the most expensive plant keeps dropping out of the price out of the market at the end of every round. And it tries to keep the prices low. And plus, these plants aren't very good. So you can't just suddenly build a bunch of power plants, or sorry, a bunch of this is the part in power grid I always get confused for. There's I can't remember what buildings on the board are compared to the power plants in front of you. You can't build a lot of buildings on the board because you won't be able to power them because your power plants aren't good enough. And that's by design that you won't be able to get the big ones. Plus, at the start of the game, you don't have any money. So you're never going to do like this huge, I'm going to go through these three routes and build way over there. You'll never be able to afford it. So you're limited to the stuff that's really close to the start of the board and your starting position, pro probably only building one new connection every turn where is that seventh round or 14th round when everyone's got seven houses and you do the round where you put out five different houses and you figure out how to cut someone off and it's so different from the beginning of the game and then there's the one additional rule where you can only build one power plant in every city which is again going to limit the amount of your options and, and be able to cut people off and things like that this is really a true engine builder, right? Then that's, that's engine builders in general are great at this because it's only once you get going that all the options become available. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, a power grid is one of those ones that intimidates me merely by its name and, and the, <laughs> the sort of uh, hidden mystery behind the, oh my God, it's power grid. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and and it's one of those things that and uh, well, no, I, I know for a fact that the other the other one that feels like that is in some ways and that's food chain magnet, um, yeah, no. which which actually is uh, that hard, at least it by uh, by its ranking levels. But those are those are two games where uh, and they, they are really comparable because food chain magnet is actually a crazy difficult game where mm -hmm. you can lose the game in the first turn. Yes. Versus power grid, which has this ramping up ability to it uh but they both sort of have that same mystique about them where they intimidate players uh one rightly and one wrongly and the one so that one is power grid all right finally we're going to get talking about intimidations and games that scare people I, I had to include at least one of these on here and that is a train game uh there there was a time where if you just said i want to play a train game or oh you're a train game there was a connotation to that now this has changed a bit because there's a, now a very solid gateway train game ticket to ride that almost everyone knows so nowadays when you say train game most people think ticket to ride but there was a time before ticket to ride where train game meant these heavy crayon rail games or 18xx style stock market games now, Steam is the game I'm throwing on the list. This is Steam Rails to Riches, specifically, or the, the new printing of it that was kickstarted. I think it's still called Rails to Riches. Specifically, not Age of Steam or Railways of the World or the other variants. Just Steam from uh, Merton Wallace. This is a game that, to me, sits right in the middle. It, it's the, uh, the... It's not... Ticket to Ride, simple, just it's rummy with trains, and it's not an 18xx with a million things to worry about. It's... Rope building with having much fewer options than an 18xx game. Plus, you only control your train route, which is a huge thing compared to the stock market games. You're not buying companies and selling. You're just worried about your own set of tracks and your own connections, trying to deliver cubes from the cities you connect to to other cities that you connect to. Now, I obviously wouldn't consider Steam a gateway game. But I think it's a great stepping stone to heavier train games, as well as just being a solid rail system on its own. Uh, 
Now, there are two sets of rules that are included in Steam. There is rules for an auction. And if you want this to be the simple teach, you ditch that. Now, that's the auction system is from the Age of Steam series of games, which is why I'm saying go with Steam, not Age of Steam, because it removes that. Now, a player orders just randomized, and you pick a roll at the start of the turn that gives you a bonus, instead of having to auction money, because it's so hard to value those auctions if you don't know the game. So toss out the auction rules, which are optional. So I'm not like saying modify the game. Toss out the optional auction rules, play Steam as written. It is still to this day my favorite train game just because of how accessible it is. It gives me that heavy train game feel without the intimidation and brain burn and six to seven hour gameplay time of an 18xx. Yeah, I mean, route building train games are not something that interests me. Uh, and so if you if you if you'd say, hey, I've got a Martin Wallace game for me, yeah, I may or may not have interest, but it's good to know that there are these options that for the people who do like that kind of game can get into this heavier side of the game uh, rather than a ticket to ride and, and get there with ease, right, mm -hmm. without being completely overwhelmed and spending the next 12 hours of your life locked into a room with people playing 18xx. And for that option, you've got Steam. All right, I've got, that was 12 games tonight uh, that we have featured today, which I think had a pretty broad range of games as well as difficulties in that. But I do have three honorable mentions. These are games that I think are surprisingly easy, but have something that made me keep them off this list. So the first one is going to be Concordia. I was really tempted to put this on this list when doing research for this episode tonight and looking at what other people have on lists like this. Concordia was on almost every one. Like, it's a pretty simple game. It looks intimidating. It's a trading in the Mediterranean game. You start off at Rome. You spread out. You're getting resources, building cities. You're traveling over the Mediterranean Sea, all kinds of stuff. But each turn is really simple. You have a bunch of cards you play, pick one card from your hand and you do what it says on the card. And that's it. And each individual card in action is pretty simple. One's like move your guy and build a building or trade goods at a spot or build a new port, right? It's pretty simple. The problem with this game is the scoring. The scoring in Concordia was so opaque that the rules actually suggest that you stop your first game halfway through, hold a special scoring round so that all the players are on the same page before you get to the end of the game so no one's frustrated by how poorly they did because they didn't understand it. Like I have seen people think they are doing fantastic and they got stuff all over the board and they got their handful of cards and they're like, this is awesome. And then they come in last place and just get frustrated because they totally didn't understand what the actual goal of the game was. So they were doing things, but it wasn't towards the right targets. And that's why I don't think Concordia quite makes this list, though I do have to say it's easier than it looks. Just watch out for that scoring. Yeah, it's interesting. Concordia is actually uh, ranked easier than many, if not all, of the games we've already mentioned. Yeah. But that one little twist can just ruin your night if, <laughs> if not handled and, and learned properly. And that is Concordia. All right, next. I know our chat room's already brought this one up tonight. That is Tale to Walk in City of the Gods. Now, again, the rules aren't hard. The mechanics aren't hard. And yes, this fits the intimidates the hell out of people with the massive board and all kinds of stuff on it and dice and a pyramid and, and painting tiles and all these different action spots. And you start playing and you're like, this isn't bad at all. I just moved my dice. It's just a giant rondelle. Wow, this is it. This is a rondelle. And I move and I collect my resources to do the things. Here's the few things that get us points. No problem. Should be on this list for that reason. But... Concordia is one of the fiddliest games in my collection. There are so many things that trigger off of other things that are easy Tale to, to walk forget. In, not Concordia. Sorry, I said <laughs> Concordia's. I don't even know where I, that's, I, you know, I'm off script when I'm not even looking. <laughs> um, so yes, there are so many things in Teo to walk in it, that, that what keeps it off this list is the fiddliness because almost like everything you do triggers something else. So you go to the building spot and when you build something, you're going to put a tile on the thing. And when you put a tile on the thing, you're going to match up the symbols. And if the symbols match up, you're going to go up on the God track. Well, when you go up on the God track, it's going to give you an extra action. It's going to give you a brick. And when you get a brick, you're going to look over to your technology tree and go, well, I'm using action number six. And when I use action number six, I get a free coin. And then when I get a free coin, I'm going to go over and it's going to put me up on this other track. And I'm just making this up. Like if you played Teotihuacan, you know I'm 
not quite talking about actual progression there, but it's like that. There's, there's always this one thing that triggers the God track, which can trigger the other thing, which can trigger the other God track, which can trigger the path of the dead. And every time I play this game, someone forgets something. And it's one of those where it's like three turns later and it's like, oh, I forgot to take my cocoa for going here. Or, oh, I forgot I had this technology. So when I was over here and got gold, I should have actually gotten extra gold. And that happens every game. This is one of the few board games where I honestly think it's better in a digital adaptation because of all these little things that are so easy to miss. And that is what's keeping it off this list. Because overall, the mechanics are so much simpler than the game would imply, but it's those chain reactions that are so easily forgotten that keeps it off the list for tonight. Yeah, we definitely need to... Uh... Well, I need to sit down and watch a Let's Play, and then we need to start up a table at BGA because uh, it's a terrifying game to look at set up. Uh, yeah. It's just just horrifying to see that on a table spread out going, where do you even start? Yeah. But again, it you know, especially with BGA, where it can track everything for you, mm -hmm. um, definitely something that's uh, more approachable in that way. So the digital ver uh, version should be on our main list, but because of the fiddliness, it only gets an honorable mention, and that is Teotihuacan. All right, my final game for tonight is going to be Keyflower. This is another one that's going to scare people whenever I bring it out. There's no doubt about that. Uh, just you got different colored meeple behind your screens and trying to value the different tiles. And then the explanation that some tiles don't actually do anything unless you set up an engine to use them. Like this is only worth points once you deliver goods to it and how you upgrade things. Like there's a lot going on. Now, once you start playing, though, I find people pick this up really quickly and it's not as bad. And people love the ability to use other people's boards like that's just such a neat mechanic that you're building your own thing. But you can you're, when you can use your opponent's stuff. It's just a neat way, neat thing to see in a game like this. But there are two things for me that keep Keyflower off the main list. And the first is how bidding and outbidding other players works with the meeples, especially the ones placed on the tiles. People send to get the auction on the outside of the tile, but when you place them on and you always have to place more meeple than the previous person and then there's a max that you can bid, that, that catches people up every time. The second is the fact that in the first round of the game, you are handed winter tiles and you have to decide which ones you keep. Well, these winter tiles are end game scoring. Well, to properly pick a winter tile, you have to kind of know the entire game and how it works before you can make a good decision. So yes, you could just sit down and go, you know what, just pick one, we'll just play. But this isn't one of those, we play it quickly, let's play twice in a night kind of games. This is a heavier brain burning game. You're probably not gonna wanna play that second game. And it's also not like other games where I say, just play a couple rounds and start over because these winter tiles don't come effect until the last round of the game. So it's those two things that has me not place Keyflower on the list. Though overall, it's way simpler than it looks for intimidation factor, but just those two elements keep it off this list. And yet another one that is on Board Game Arena that we really probably ought to... Uh, is it? Yeah, it is. Oh. I, I actually hadn't been aware it was, but I, I did a quick check and it is there. So well, that's uh, a good one. Something else we need to... Uh, we, we need to up our, uh, our, our Board Game Arena plays, uh, apparently. Uh, and that is Keyflower. Now there are some... You have, have some of the best games that were actually easier to play than we expected. Gonna head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. So there's been a bunch of chatter going on. Uh, Ryan suggest expected Dungeon Lords to get a mention tonight. Oh, uh, that, that, would, that would be no, <laughs> not at all. Dungeon Lords oh. does not. That was on the other list. Dungeon Lords was on our games that are way more complicated than they look like they're going to be. Yeah. There were, I will admit, there were a lot of games that could have been on the list tonight. There, I, I could have easily done top 25. It's just the last time we did one of these, we had 25 episodes, we went over time. So I decided to cut it down <laughs> to 12 nominations and three, uh, three honorable mentions, but I definitely could have done some more. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, uh, one of the Daniels is mentioning... Uh... Uh, for Feld, Notre Dame is easier than they expected. No, I agree. Notre Dame was I'm, on my short list. It was one I was definitely considering. In um, excuse me, in the Year of the Dragon is another I think Feld that is surprisingly easy. Um, uh, what was the other one? I had another Feld. Is it Feld? Maybe it's not Feld. I am drawing a blank. I can <laughs> picture the board. I can't even remember if this game's a Stephen Feld or not. Let alone the name of the game. So now I'm totally <laughs> off somewhere. 
What was the name of that? Wow, I'm drawing a blank. All right, if I think of it, I'll bring it up. <laughs> but yeah, in general, Stefan Feld's like, I saw Trajan on someone's list, and I'm like, how hard did you think it would be? Because my <laughs> God, that game is hard to teach. That is not an easy to teach right. game. I hate teaching Trajan. I love the game. Um, but I'm like, I don't see how that could be simpler than anyone expected. Like, you, you must have expected absolutely horrible. Um, Vinhos Deluxe was another one I almost put on here. And Vinhos Deluxe gets the nod because the actions you take make sense to the theme. And that's where it's easier to learn than you'd expect. Because you're like, you're going to a wine tasting. So, of course, you want to hire a taster before you go. And you well, Assuming you know something the... about wine. I'm sure there's plenty well, yeah, of people. So, yeah, but even, <laughs> it, even if you have the, the, the cursory, if you think it's the kind of thing you'd want at a wine festival, it's probably in the game, right? Like, you don't have to actually know. Uh, and uh, uh, Pennywise mentions uh, he prefers Brass Birmingham. Uh, as being more fun and agrees with uh, both Jazolkin, Teotihuacan, and Pulsar. There and, you go. And Jaws and Lions. So we're, and Jaws we're, hitting, so we're, we're on the same there page on, there. on the same page with Daniel. Now, Ryan mentions uh, he finds it difficult to gauge whether a game is actually easier than it seems. And I agree that this is a, a sort of a, a tough and, and ethereal concept. Mm. Um, I think one of the good uh, judgments is, uh, and, and I agree, this is going to be a little more tough for you, Ryan. I, I apologize, but how it looks, uh, on the box and on the table, you know, how a game, uh, looks and, and the, the spread factor. and the intimidation factor is a big, big thing. Uh, if you look at something like Gloomhaven, for example, it's a hex grid, dungeon tiles, a few monsters and some cards. It really doesn't look that difficult. It looks like your standard RPG uh, hack and slash until you look at those cards and understand mm -hmm. the, the the resource management and the, li the the extreme limits involved, and it ramps up. Whereas if you look at something like um, Teotihuacan, it's got this huge, terrifying uh, you know setup out there in front of you. And there's so many little fiddly bits that, that you, you know, where do you start? Uh, and a lot of it, I think, is going to depend on your teacher, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not if you're if you're just sitting down with that first um, with that first play and you don't have a teacher, you're just sitting there with a, an open box in front of you and a, and a rule book. Uh, they can be terrifying until you realize that they've got these easy build up mechanics or whatever it is that got them onto this list uh, that just made it that much easier to start playing and start enjoying and that's actually mm -hmm. one of the big things i find is you can play a game and muddle through it but you got to get to that point where you're playing it and enjoying it even if you're not doing well mm -hmm. you can be enjoying the fact that you're playing it and not stressing out at how terrifyingly difficult everything is the first time through three uh. pm has fallen asleep on us <laughs> All right. Um, not so I'm still trying to remember the name of that one game, and I'm drawing <laughs> a complete blank, like complete and total. I see a lot of people say say uh, Mage Knight, but I did not find that. I found that way pain in the butt to learn. And I see people like Indonesia. No, the merging rules are horrible. But yeah, it's definitely subjective, right? This goes along with Roger's topic of a couple weeks ago on how much your, your play experience affects your the, the weight of the games. Hansa Teutonica. That was the name of the game I was trying to think of. Hansa I had Teutonica. it on the list and I there deleted it. That's a Feld 2, isn't it? Uh, I think so. That's the other, it, assuming it's a Feld, that's the other <laughs> Feld that I find is way easier. No, it's not. Okay. I was okay. like, maybe it's not. No, it's Andrea <laughs> Stedding. But it's a Euro that's just like way simpler than it looks like it's going to be. But then once you see the, the difficulty and the backstabbing, it gets way better game. But that's another like plays in like an, an hour and a lot like that's that's my my ticket to ride Euro. If you want a Euro feeling ticket to ride because you're route building between these German guilds and you're just putting cubes out instead of trains. But that is a, a really good one. That was on the list and I took it off because it was just it's out of print for one. So I, I sometimes I hate 
<laughs> recommending like games no one can actually can't go recommend buy. all the games that no one uh, yeah that's <laughs> no the other reason buy. like oh grande is still in print but most of uh, some of the ones i took off the list tonight were a little too hard to find i thought for including. well i mean even your version of agricola agricola oh yeah you can't get that <laughs> but like I, I know the new version has at least some aspects and like i said plus there's the family version which i have to assume makes it even simpler somehow yeah. all right okay let's <laughs> uh no no Jet Set is more difficult than it is. I don't know Jet Set. Uh, Your Vic is pretty simple. Yeah, that's a Feld that's pretty simple. Well, I know it as Speaker Stat, but yeah. Speaker Stat is pretty simple. Uh, da -da. Yeah, <laughs> Ryan, what game are you trying to remember? That didn't help. Looks can be deceiving. Um, I don't like in a way. Some of it I think is subjective. So Jet so, Jet Set's a, a route building, uh, playing game, card drafting, route building. Uh, okay. Airplane game. So it's Ticket to Ride with airplanes. So what I what I think we should do, and I think this is actually going to happen, is what I think I want to do is I want to dive into this more next week. So when we get to our philosophical topic, I think I want to talk about what makes games easier, All what right. what designers can do to make games easier, which we, we can really highlight Jaws of the Lion as an example. Mm -hmm. But just things like onboarding, limiting decisions. Um, I actually almost threw that in as part of the discussion before the main topic today, but then Deanna pointed out that's probably a standalone topic and long enough right. that it's going to take us half an episode to talk about before. So I'm like, all right, we'll break it off. So that may that that may be what we do next week is dive into dive into what, what designers can do and not what games do it well, because we've already done that, but what makes these games Right. easier than we expect them to be sounds good finally if you've got a game or game night question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or email me questions at tabletopbellhop.com <laughs>